The Hussite wagon fort answered a problem in late medieval warfare that puzzled military leaders of the time. How could infantry deal with armies of heavily armored knights on horseback? Initially, the Hussite armies consisted mainly of ill-trained farmers and city dwellers, often only armed with the daily tools of your average farmer, such as pitchforks, thrashing flails, but also pole arms. But they made a virtue out of necessity and combined their farmers' wagons with early handheld firearms and small artillery, and managed to defend successfully against well-trained and well-equipped knights. Throughout the medieval and early modern periods, a number of strategies and infantry formations were explored to fight heavily armored knights effectively. One strategy was to choose the terrain of battles with great care, to use field fortifications and bottlenecks, such as the Scottish at the Battle of Loudon Hill in 1307, the Flemish at the Battle of Courtric in 1302, or the English at Crecy in 1346. Another strategy was to deploy deep pike squares, as the Swiss did at Nancy in 1477, the German Landsknechte at Bicocca in 1522, and the Spanish Dercio at Rocroix in 1643. However, in the early 1400s, the Hussite wagon fort was a particularly spectacular way of coping with knights. Contemporary historiography tells the story of the Hussites' military innovation as follows. The wagon fort was found by an important military leader of the Hussites, the military genius Jan Shishka. Shishka was the son of a bohemian aristocrat. He pursued a military career and fought, for example, at the famous Battle of Tannenberg in 1410. He eventually became a well-known tactician and expert on exploiting geographical conditions and terrain. In the aftermath of the first defenestration of Prague in 1419, he quickly took a key position in the early Hussite revolts due to his military experience. Later, he became the military leader of the Hussites. Hussite is a blanket term, referring to various religious reformatory and revolutionary movements in 15th century Bohemia. These movements shared a conviction in the teachings of the theologian Jan Hus, hence the name Hussites. The conflict between the reformatory movements and the church establishment escalated in 1420. In early March, Pope Martin V issued the first of five crusades against the Hussites, because they refused to abandon their heretical teachings. Shishka was now hard-pressed to come up with a way to counter the heavily armed and well-trained knights, while his own army consisted of many farmers and city dwellers, but only few war-experienced men. At the Battle of Sudomer, he faced the enemy knights for the first time. The 400 Hussites awaited them between several lakes and a swamp. Their front line and left flank were covered by a mere 12 wagons, but they still managed to repel the first enemy charge. Subsequently, the Imperials tried to outflank the Hussites, but moved into a swamp, which forced them to dismount from their horses. This meant they gave away much of their advantage. Shishka and his men turned around and charged them, flails swinging. In this marshy terrain, the Hussites were on equal footings with the dismounted knights and defeated them in melee. The Hussites suffered many casualties as well, but in the end managed to retreat successfully. According to Volker Schmidtchen, the expert on Hussite wagon forts, Shishka looked at the qualities of his men and soon realized he really only had two things going for him. His men's trust in the ability of their leaders and their exceptionally high fighting morale much of which was due to their strong religious cohesion. Regarding those givens, he discarded to train his men in the knightly way of warfare and looked for a strategy and for weaponry his men were already familiar with and which did not require much further training. He found it on one hand in the daily tools of farmers, such as pickaxes, axes and thrashing flails reinforced with iron bands and nails. In the words of historian Rudolf Urbanek, quote, the habitual instruments in daily use by the peasants and artisans were made to serve new purposes." End quote. Additionally, the defensive duties on the city walls had familiarized many urban dwellers with crossbows and the new technology of early handheld firearms and artillery, while the farmers added their experience in handling wagons and horses. Shishka's strategy was based on the special, though meager abilities of his fighting force and followed two fundamental principles. Firstly, that action should never be imposed by the enemy. And secondly, that defensive warfare was superior to offensive warfare. The result was a surprisingly successful combination of early firearms and simple wagons. Of course, wagons had been used in warfare since antiquity, 
mainly as a means of transport to secure the retinue or to create semi-permanent camps. Shishka, in contrast, made them the centerpiece of his new strategy. He counted on mobility and sturdiness. The marching order of his army was set up so that the entire convoy could be turned very quickly into a wagon fort. By doing so, a strong defensive position could be installed, regardless of the terrain. This made it possible to bring defensive warfare to the open battlefield. This meant that now a defensive strategy could be used offensively. Shishka's men were already familiar with defending all kinds of defensive positions, a skill which could now be transferred to open field battles. This rendered the ill-trained and under-equipped Hussites well capable to cope with the heavily armored and well-trained knights. About the offensive use of the Hussite wagons, Aeneas Silvanus Piccolomini, who later became Pope Pius II, even wrote the wagons were sometimes used to encircle and cut off parts of enemy armies. But most historians regard this as highly controversial, if not simply as a myth. In the early days of the conflict, the Hussites used simple farmers' wagons. But after first combat experiences, they optimized their vehicles for actual war. Shishka ordered specialized war wagons to be built after 1322. Those wooden tanks were bigger and more stable than the carts intended for transport. The crew could enter the wagon through collapsible ramps. Additional planks reinforced the outer walls, and the lock on the top also allowed a second protective side panel to be attached to further fortify the wagon. This additional plating consisted either of two massive horizontal wooden planks, or of planks with triangular embrasures. This outer wall, which had a simple protective function, was placed in a slight angle, resembling a capital A, in order to break up the trajectory of an incoming missile or cannonball. Schmidtchen noted that each wagon carried along one of those additional walls, and it was always attached to the side which faced potential danger. To prevent being shot at from underneath the wagon, another plank was placed between the bottom and the ground. The crew of a war wagon usually consisted of about 20 men, two of whom took care of the horses, six were crossbowmen, two were equipped with hand cannons, eight carried flails, morning stars, pikes or halberds, and two men carried big square shields called pavises to cover gaps and sally ports. When on the move, the Hussite wagons formed up to four columns and kept the outer rows longer than the ones in the center to be able to form a wagon fort quickly. But marching in four columns was often impossible anyways because of the terrain. Yet experience showed that even when marching in two columns, the transformation could be done very quickly. At the tip of the convoy, a group of engineers and sappers cleared obstacles out of the way. Flags were used to pass orders along the convoy quickly. A department of light cavalry was responsible for scouting ahead, and two additional, slightly bigger cavalry formations formed a van and a rear guard. Their main purpose was to delay enemy attacks so that the convoy had enough time to set up the wagon fort. The fort was either round or square, depending on the circumstances of the terrain. After the wagons were put in position, the horses were brought to a place in the center of the formation and the wagons were bound together with chains. The pavise bearers closed potential gaps in the formation and the sally ports, while the artillery and the hand cannons awaited the attack. Most of the foot soldiers left the wagons and joined the rest of the infantry, who often fought independently of the wagons' crews. Note, however, that the Hussites relied on clear and strict hierarchies. Each wagon formed a tactical unit and had its own commander. This enabled them to react quickly and execute orders of the general immediately and efficiently. Once the wagon formation was completed and everyone in position, the second pillar of Shishka's strategy came to action. The small and mid-sized guns within the wagons. These were loaded with heavy stone balls or scatter shots consisting of nails, small rocks or lead bullets. Volker Schmidtchen stresses the efficiency of such rounds, quote, At an average fighting distance of about 100 meters, such scatter shots had a devastating effect on both cavalry and foot soldiers alike, end quote. In contrast to the static artillery positions the Hussite city dwellers knew from their fortified home cities, the guns on wagons had an additional benefit. They could be moved between and within the wagons very quickly. In some Hussite armies, the guns on carts made up a fifth of all the wagons. 
This means that a wagon train of 185 fighting wagons had 35 cannons at its disposal. Whenever possible, they were concentrated on the front from which an attack was to be expected. In most cases, one artillery volley was enough to take most of the momentum away from attacking troops. After the enemy's onslaught had been interrupted by the artillery, the pavises covering the sally ports stepped aside and the infantry launched a counterattack. In many cases, the foot soldiers attacked the enemy through the closest sally port, while the cavalry left through a gap in the back of the formation. They would ride around and get in the back of the enemy to charge them and then to run them down relentlessly. The Hussite wagon fort left a great impression on the army leaders and tacticians of the time, and there were various attempts to integrate it into other armies. Until the 17th century, wagon forts were mentioned again and again as an integral part of armies. However, no one implemented them as efficiently as the Hussites. The development of more and more powerful firearms made the defense with wooden wagons obsolete. They could no longer withstand enemy fire, so that they eventually disappeared from the battlefields of Europe. <laughs>